Okay, I think we're live. Good morning, everybody. Sorry for the delay. Again, I was just trying to make sure this stream was going to go live. Hope everyone's doing well. Again, uh, got a different style of lecture planned for today. Um, I kind of want to get more and more into function because last year we've kind of focused um, more on talking about anatomy, just strictly fundamental anatomy. <laughs> So we kind of uh, developed the foundation doing that. And the goal for this year is to kind of dive into function uh, a little bit more. So that's the plan for today. Um, and I'll just keep admitting people as they come in, but we're gonna get started right away because I'm already kind of a couple minutes late. I will figure out this YouTube thing once and for all, I promise. Okay. so. Um, just to go over the four fundamental tissue types again, uh, we spoke about them before, uh, but we have the epithelia, so the skin of the body. Uh, we also have the nervous tissue, as well as our muscle tissue and our connective tissue. And uh, last time we kind of dived into our bone tissue a little bit more, which is a, one of our connective tissue types. Um, today, we're going to be diving in more into muscular tissue, um, as well as some proper connective tissue, so uh, the fascia of the human body as well. Um, we're going to talk about uh, connective tissue plasticity a little bit more as well. You know what? So yeah, let's go over the plan. I forgot to go over the plan. So today, we're going to be talking about the piezoelectric effect um, and why it's so cool as to how it works. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, mechanical stress a bit on the human body. Um, we're going to talk about the problems of poor posture. Uh, we're going to talk about the source of the poor posture. So I wrote desk jockey edition. So we're going you can imagine what kind of posture we're going to be talking about, as well as a couple of simple fixes for that posture. Okay, so let's uh, dive right in. So uh, the piezoelectric effect, um, it sounds really complicated. It's not. Um, pretty much all tissues of the human body generate some sort of an electric field uh, when they are put under some form of mechanical stress. So if you look at the diagram to the top left over here, you'll see a box and what's being applied from both direction is a compressive effect. Now, this will lead to a structural deformity. So you can imagine compressing something like um, a tissue paper and it will kind of deform, right? And that deformation actually creates a charge through this piezoelectric effect. Now, um, if you guys remember from last lecture, we kind of dived into um, the connective tissue at the cellular level and how it's formed. So we have what you remember as the fibroblasts. These are the cells that generate um, the collagen of the human body. Um, they are the ones that lay down collagen, okay? Um, now the electrical field that's caused by a stretch to the tissue actually gives these cells the signal to lay down new collagen, collagen along uh, lines of stress. So I'm just going to admit someone else here. All right, so you have this compressive force, or it could also be a tensile force. So it could be a compression or a pull that's exerted on your tissue, um, these fibroblasts will respond to the electrical charge that's generated by that to lay down more collagen. And in doing so, it will lay it down in a way that kind of reflects what happens. So if there's a tensile pull, you're gonna be getting more collagen laid down along these lines of stress. Um, and that's gonna create greater resistance to that tissue over time. 
right? Our bodies are very dynamic and they respond to stress by becoming more fortified, um, more resistant to it, right? Because our bodies are always trying to protect ourselves. Um, and it just comes down to fundamentally what we talked about last time, which was um, connective tissue. The connective tissue of our body kind of responds to the demands we put on it. Um, and this is fundamentally how this happens through the piezoelectric effect. Um, now, on the flip side, if we don't have this tension, um, our body would just look like a disorganized mess, right? It, it would just, we would have no lines of stress. We'd have this really disorganized pattern of collagen in our body. And so you can imagine how important it is to have stress on our body. Okay. So let's now think about why it's kind of hard to fix poor posture. So um, I kind of also wrote on the side that any type of posture is a mechanical stress. Uh, we don't think of poor posture being a stress to the human body, but what, what you're doing with poor posture is you're putting yourself in a stereotypical position where gravity exerts its force on you, right? So in the picture over here, we have a typical slump posture where the shoulders are sitting a bit forward, the neck is poking forward, and the shoulders are kind of back. You got that kyphosis in your upper back. Um, these are all things that happen with the stress of gravity being exerted on it, right? So there is a mechanical stress. Um, and some tissues will be compressed, some tissues will be pulled. And these are both things that the fibroblasts of the body will react to and lay down more collagen, right? Um, let's see. So in the in this slump posture again, the chin pokes forward, the chest gets short, falls back, the shoulders round forward. Um, if you look at the two structures, we have the structures at the front over here, and the structures at the back over here. So the structures at the front, including your pec major, your anterior delts, um, even the long neck flexors over here, they all get locked in a short position, right? So these muscles shorten and they get stuck there, right? Because they spend a lot of time compressed there. Um, your body is going to keep laying down the collagen, get it stuck there, okay? Um, versus the muscles in the back, which are put in a more tensile or a stretch load, they're locked in a lengthened position. So they're constantly in the pull. And so the body is going to respond to keep it in that pull over time. Um, and so that's why it's actually really hard to fix poor posture and why so many people deal with it, right? It's not as simple as just, you know, sitting up straight, right? Because you have to kind of act against the resistance of your soft tissue. Um, the ones that we kind of mentioned right now, the ones at the front, the ones at the back, right? The ones at the front have to lengthen. The ones at the back have to shorten, right? So you're almost always going to meet a lot of resistance to do that. And so it takes time to get rid of poor posture, right? Uh, now there's two things you fundamentally have to consider when um, trying to get rid of this poor posture, this slump posture. Um, you have to kind of reopen any tissue that's been locked through things like uh, myofascial release. So things like deep, deep tissue work, I'll kind of do deep tissue work with my clients, really just trying to work it out mechanically using my own stress. Uh, joint mobilization, so getting the joints of the human body to kind of move in directions they're not accustomed to. So in the case of your upper back, applying stresses that will open up extension versus that flexion that's always stuck in, um, and then corrective exercises, right? So we talked about a few things that you can do for your upper back. We're going to dive into that a little bit more later in the lecture. Um, but doing all these things will help do a few things. It'll help promote fluid flow, of course. Um, it's going to improve the muscle function itself because now it's not going to be locked. You can actually contract and lengthen it pretty efficiently. And it's actually going to reconnect to your nervous system a little bit more because now you're going to get much more feedback if the muscles are moving a lot more. Um, the, sen the second fundamental thing you have to do to kind of fix poor posture is you got to ease the mechanical stress that's being put on it. So in the case of our desk jockeys, it's this constant compressive force of the front and lengthening force of the back through repetitive use. So eight hours straight just spent in this locked posture 
is going to keep you locked, right? It's a time effect. It's not like they're putting a lot of stress. It's just they're stuck there for eight hours. So it's the gravity that's exerting that force on them. You got to get out of that. So you need frequency in a more extended position. So in the case of just normal faulty posture, you got to address it with what we could talk about, myofascial release, exercise, joint mobilizations. If it gets really bad, you might even need like stabilization through orthotics and braces at the very extreme cases where it's just really, really bad and there's nothing more you can really do. Um, the above two points will help kind of undo all the remodeling that took place with the poor posture. So we talk about why that remodeling happens through the piezoelectric effect. Um, the degrees to which the person will need to do the two above points, like I mentioned, so reopening the tissue that's locked and easing the mechanical stress that's put on it depends on how faulty and stuck they are at, in the long run. Um, but I always tell my patients that the posture itself took a long time to develop so it will take quite a bit of time to get out of that. It will take consistent and frequent effort over a, a set duration of time. It's not an easy fix. It never is. And anyone who tells you it's an easy fix, they're just lying to you. Any questions so far, by the way? So stop me if you guys have any questions. Just uh, throw one through the comment section. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about some inherent problems with poor posture. And the obvious slash not so obvious one is uh, poor circulation. So we got a couple diagrams here. I'll explain in a bit. Um, blood circulation is of utmost importance to our human body, right, guys? And so... Okay, so we have a question. Do you support the braces to correct posture that seems so popular right now? I do not support anything, generally speaking, right? It's always based on person by person scenario. If you're talking about those slings that keep you in that kind of, you know, good posture that pull your, you know, you know, your shoulders back. I'm not a big believer in that because it's not addressing really the true cause, which is uh, a set, you know, tightness and a weakness going this way, right? So um, but I'm talking about like the more extreme cases where you might even have like a compression fracture. That's, that's where I might lean towards braces or orthotics that might correct that. Right. But if it's just your typical poor posture and it's just causing aches and pains, um, braces are usually not the way that I would recommend just because there's a lot you can do movement wise and strengthening wise and just like overall correction ergonomically that you can fix it without needing to use braces. And the problem with braces as well is if you use them, now you have a passive support, but you're not actually strengthening the muscles that we keep you there, right? So those are some of the inherent issues with things like braces, for example. Good question, by the way. Okay, so um, why is blood so important? It carries a bunch of really important things for us, right guys? So oxygen, obviously that's the, that's the energy for the muscles to function. We got our nutrients that are being passed around and we got chemical messengers. So things like hormones that are intended for all the cells of our human body. And, um, the blood that has left the heart communicates with the rest of the body at points called capillary beds. So, it leaves the heart through arteries, starting with your aorta. So right out the heart, goes into these smaller arteries and eventually goes to everywhere in the body at capillary beds. We haven't really dived into like the anatomy of your cardiovascular system. My hope is to eventually do a course on the organs. Um, but for now, just it's just, that's how it happens, right? It goes to the capillary beds and this is where all these nutritious materials like the oxygen, the nutrients and the messengers can kind of leak into the connective tissue of our body, right? So um, if you take a look at the diagram to the right over here, you'll see what kind of that connective tissue matrix looks like. So you have the fibers like your collagen and your elastin. Um, these are kind of what create that mesh network in our um, connective tissue, which we talked about in our first lecture. 
And then in between this mesh network, you got what is known as a ground substance, which is the fluid that fills it up. So last time we gave the example of bone, how you start off with more of a viscous fluidy type of material in the younger bone. And then over time it becomes um, filled with more mineral salts and uh, more, it becomes more crystalline in the older bone. And that's why it becomes more rigid, easier to break. Um, same idea with anywhere in the human body where you have that mesh network with the fiber and then you have the ground substance, okay? And this is where um, these capillaries have to leak into uh, for all these nutritious materials from the blood to kind of access all the cells in the human body, right? So, yeah. Um, with poor posture and lack of movement per se, um, the circulation does become a problem for a few reasons. I think the more obvious one is that um, your heart, your heart's output just decreases, right? So when your muscles are not contracting, they don't need as much oxygen to keep going. Your heart doesn't have to pump as much blood. And with the decreased exertional demand through lack of movement and exercise, you're just not going to get a lot of blood flow. And so what happens is over time, it's kind of like a negative feedback loop where you, you, you don't use your muscles, so you get less blood flow to them. Because you get blood, less blood flow to them, they're less active. And then because of that, you it's just it's just a horrible cycle, right? So the more obvious one is movement will promote blood flow, right? But the less obvious one and kind of the one that's more related to our lecture is that the connective tissue properties of a body with poor posture and movement um, does deteriorate, actually. So um if you look at this diagram again you have that mesh network you have the ground substance how easily the nutrients from the blood can make it to the target cells of the human body are determined by a the density of this fibrous matrix so all these fibers as well as b the viscosity or the thickness of that ground substance over here right so if the fibers over here are too dense or the fluid in between the fibers are too dehydrated or too thick, um, the target cells of the human body um, won't be as thoroughly fed and watered by the blood flow. And so um, we talked about how the remodeling works with the connective tissue and how things get really thick and tight. Um, this is where circulation becomes a problem as well at the, le at the level of collagen and your connective tissue. Um, now, some of these factors, like the density of your collagen and your elastin fibers and that mesh network, are determined by genetic and nutritional factors, but they're also determined by things like exercise, trauma, or excessive strain, right? All righty. Okay, so let's dive into the problems of poor posture reason number two. And so reason number two is going to be um, muscle tightness. So you get faulty movement patterns from muscle tightness. Um, now I'd like you to kind of look at how poor posture can influence movement of the human body at level of both the muscles and the joints in the next slide. Uh, over here, we see what is known as a standing flexion test. So um, it's a test I often use in clinic. Um, and it kind of tells me a story as to how an individual spine um, is moving as well as how tight their posterior chain, meaning the bottom of their foot, their calves, their hamstrings, and their glutes are, right? Um, how tight they are. Um, now with this test, the person must keep their knees straight. And what I'll get them to do is without bending the back first, reaching down as far as they can. And then I assess how much range of motion they have doing that. And then um, afterwards, I allow them to kind of reach down a little bit further while allowing their back to cave. And so it kind of gives me an idea of a few things. A, how much tightness is in their posterior chain. So things like their hamstrings, their glutes, their calves. And B, when and where they start using their spine too much. So if you look at the individual to the left over here, um, this guy for sure has really tight hamstrings. I mean, you're probably getting 70, 70 degrees of, <laughs> of hip flexion over here. So um, 
So we immediately see with this test that they're bending predominantly from the back to cause their movement, right? Now, there are inherent problems with this, right? Um, the main one being, if you were to need to lift something um, from the floor, um, where do you think most of that pressure is going to go when individual over here, individual number one, tries to lift it all, um, from the floor? It's probably not going to go through your glutes and your hamstrings as much, right? Because they're not really lengthening and loading eccentrically. It's actually going to probably go more through their lumbar and their thoracic spine, right? Because that's where all the movements generally happening. Now, I'm not saying most people will elect to keep their knees straight um, when lifting something, but this will even happen when the knees are bent. You're still going to get limitation in hamstring movement, and then eventually the back might take over, right? Now, the person on the right, in contrast, if you take a look, their knees are fully extended, but they're still able to achieve a lot of hip flexion without needing to curl their back because they're maintaining that neutral spine. This guy definitely looks like a yogi. This is not an easy thing to do with the back straight. So this guy has a pretty decent amount of hamstring length. Um, but you can probably imagine that if he had to lift something from the floor, he'd probably be able to load his hamstrings and glutes uh, a lot more effectively than Mr. Individual with tight hamstrings over here might be able to. And so the, another important thing about that is that you're using the stronger muscle of the, of the human body, right? So your glutes and your hamstrings are really strong. They're part of that posterior chain that kind of lift a lot of weight. This is, this is why um, you have power lifters that can now deadlift a thousand pounds, right? They're using those really strong glutes and hamstrings uh, versus the very weak um, spinal erector muscles of the back, which are not going to help you lift much weight. And this is pretty much the perfect storm for things like your disc herniations and your lumbar strains to occur when you have this kind of poor posture over here at lifting weights, right? Because these muscles of the back are just really inherently weak. And so movement will go to things like the discs of your low back now. Okay. Reason number three, you're going to get faulty movement patterns from joint tightness now. Okay. So what we see here is an example I use for a lot of my shoulder guys that get a lot of shoulder problems. Um, this is a test where I ask the individual to stand tall and lift up their shoulders as high as they can. Right now, this person is obviously asked to keep their elbows straight and lift their arms completely above head. Um, but there is a pretty much a difference between the individual on the left and individual on the right. Now, I know they're the same person, but the one on the left had asked to use a certain posture and the one on the right had asked, been asked to use a different posture, right? So the individual on the left over here has what we call that kyphotic posture. So that excessive forward flexion curvature of the thoracic spine more than is normal. Okay. Now this presents a joint, a joint tightness issue um, as the facet joints of the spine get locked over time when it spends too much time in that posture. Right? So we talk about how the muscles, uh, your pec major minor, your front delts, your neck flexors get really tight in this position. But the joints of your back, specifically the ones of the facet joints, so the ones that kind of occur between your vertebral bodies, those ones also get really tight in those position as, positions as well, right? Um, not only will this kind of lead to aching pains in your upper thoracic uh, spine, but also the neck now, because when you curl your back forward like this, in order to be able to keep looking straight, your head will have to lift up like this and your chin's going to have to poke forward, right? And this is going to cause a lot of excessive extension stress on your cervical spine now, specifically your lower cervical spine, right? Um, so another thing that really happens with the spine is if you're getting excessive curvature one way, the, the way that the body will accommodate to that is excessive curvature the other way. 
So you're going to now get excessive extension in the lower spine to kind of keep your eyes on the horizon, right? Because we always want to keep our eyes on our horizon. We don't want to look down when we're walking. We don't want to look down when we're working, right? We want to look straight at the screen that's ahead of us. So the body's always going to accommodate you using these things. And that's why when you have thoracic tightness, upper back tightness, you're also going to get that neck tightness too over time, right? It's just a comp it's a compensatory response. Um, now, there will also be issues with your shoulder range of motion over time. And this is why this diagram is kind of important now, right? Um, and this is because your kyphotic posture, so when your back's in this position, it actually affects the angle of your scapula, your shoulder blade on the rib cage, right? So when it's angled, when, you're, when your shoulder blades, okay, your shoulder blades over here, when they're angled more forward, you're gonna actually lock your ability to get any further forward flexion of your shoulder, right? Um, now on the left, the person can't lift their shoulders any higher because of that, it just jams on the joint, right? Um, the, the joint being the glenohumeral joint. Um, on the right, because your scapulas are now sitting at a higher angle when your back posture is fixed over here, your shoulders can now move a lot further up because now you're angled a lot more nicely there. And so you have more freedom of movement with your shoulder. So you can kind of see this whole trickle down effect from one thing being tight, leading to tightness in other parts of the body too. And this is more now at the joint level versus um, the previous slide was a little more at the muscular level, right? But again, the muscles and the joints do communicate to each other anyways, right? So they're both interrelated as well. Um, any questions so far, guys, by the way? We're going to take a small little break. I think I might be able to actually get this one done on time today. We'll see. Maybe five, ten minutes late. Okay. So say hello to our desk jockey. Okay. Um, I put a couple of stars in this diagram on purpose. Um, the red ones indicate the first issue we were talking about, which is the hamstring tightness. Okay. And the blue stars indicate the second problem we were talking about, which is the joint tightness of the thoracic spine. So if you look at this diagram over here, this is how most people sit at the desk. And you can do as many ergonomic trips as you want to a workplace. It's just, this is how the body loves to kind of cave down. This is the path of least resistance when someone's sitting, right? You just don't have to be active at all. It's just gravity's kind of melting you in this position. So let's focus here on the top first. We have a couple of points that I mentioned. Again, we have that upper back kyphosis. So that forward flexure, uh, forward flexion. And then over here, I kind of indicated nicely that's that extension, that extension that we get in the cervical or your neck spine that has to occur now to keep your head fixated forward, right? So that your, your eye can still be on the computer screen, right? So that's how those two things communicate with this desk posture. Now, at the level of the hamstrings, if you take a look at both these points, we know for sure over here that the hamstrings and knee flexor, right? So it gets short when the knees flexed. So this guy over here not only has his feet on the floor, he actually has his feet pulled back. And I fall victim to doing this a lot too. I don't know about you guys. Do you guys do this a lot too, where not only will you be sitting down and your knees are bent, but you actually curl them backwards. And for some reason, this feels super comfortable to me. I don't know if you guys do the same thing as well, but I just love doing this. It just, it feels great. Although my knee doesn't like me towards the end of the day because of my knee problems from before, but I just find that this is such a comfortable thing to do. And when you're doing that, your hamstring gets super short, right? Yeah, so <laughs> which I had you do that too. Um, your hamstring gets really short, right? Um, but what a lot of people fail to realize is that if you guys remember from last year when we talked about which are traditionally more tight hams or quads good question um again i can't give you a general answer because it really depends on what someone does for a living i'll tell you this though the person that's sitting for a long period of time will likely have tighter hamstrings than quads but if you get a little bit more technical 
Another thing that gets really tight penny uh, in a seated posture is your hip flexor, right? Because now when you're super flexed in this position, your hip flexors, your rectus femoris um, is also in a shortened position. And your rectus femoris is part of your quadriceps muscles too. So in a kind of like almost depressing situation, technically both your quads and your hamstrings can get pretty tight at different positions, right? Uh, but I would say more traditionally uh, speaking, your hamstrings will get a little tighter. And I'll tell you why, because at least in this position, yeah, your rectus femoris might get tight over here, but it is getting stretched when your knee is flexed over here. So at least at one point it is getting stretched versus Penny with your hamstrings where your knee is flexed in one spot and then your pelvis is in posterior pelvic tilt at the other end, right? The hamstring is also a two joint muscle. So it's not only getting shortened from the knee, it's also getting shortened from the hip, it's other point. So now you're getting this perfect storm for really, really tight hamstrings when you're in that posterior pelvic tilt. And you guys remember posterior pelvic tilt, right? So um, I'll kind of just quickly demonstrate. You have you have your anterior pelvic tilt, which is this, um, and that kind of pulls your ischial tuberosities to stretch your hamstrings. And then you got that posterior pelvic tilt where now your tailbone's kind of tucked in and your hamstrings get a little bit tighter because they just, the muscles get shortened in that position. Um, so that's the problem with this posture is you get that super, super tight hamstring as well. Um, I did a little Googling as well. Um, I'm not sure if this is completely true, but roughly, you know, 40% of workers spend the majority of their time sitting, um, at a desk or some sort of setting while working. So that's a lot of sitting. If you're spending eight to 10 hours a day doing that, right. Our body just wasn't meant for this. Okay. And I can't talk about the source of poor posture without talking about the fixes. And this is going to come as quite obvious for a lot of you guys, which is fine. Um, but our poor individual over here that just had no hamstring length, um, one of the more effective things he can do, as long as there's no prevailing pathology that's leading to problems, is getting him to lie flat on his back and getting him to put his leg up in a knee extended position, right? And getting as his bum as close to the wall as possible. Um, the reason why this is a really good one is that you can keep your back in a relatively straight position so it's not posterior pelvically tilting. When you're supine, this position is really easy to do. And you kind of just have gravity now causing this stretch because now your legs are relaxing on the wall over here and you can just stay in this position for one to two minutes. And a lot of my back pain guys that spend a lot of time sitting, and I'm probably even going to make a TikTok video of this eventually. All, all I tell them to do is like, just try this stretch. See how you feel after doing this in your back, not their hamstring. I don't care about their hamstring with this stretch. I actually tell them, tell me how this feels on your back when you do this stretch. And so I'll get them to do this for two minutes, two minutes each side doing this supine hamstring stretch. And then I'll get them to stand up and nine times out of 10, they'll be like, wow, there's literally no pressure in my back. I'm like, well, you see your hamstring is a close neighbor to your low back. And when it gets really tight, it yanks you, it pulls you into that really bad posterior pelvic tilt. And over time, if you want to lift things from the floor and you're stuck in that posterior pelvic tilt, it puts you at that higher risk of that disc herniation, guys, right? So this is one of my favorite ones I teach to my guys with super, super tight hamstrings. Of course, this is this is my really quick shotgun approach. It's not gonna fix the problem itself, but at least they get that immediate relief. And it's like that aha moment where they suddenly feel a lot less stress in their back, right? Of course, you also want to load the hamstrings, right? Because a tight hamstring doesn't necessarily mean it's a strong one, right? It's typically a weak one, actually. So a lot of the time you also wanna load the hamstring and load the, load the glutes as well to help support it and make it more functional too, okay? Now, for our second guy with that really highly kyphotic upper back posture, his inability to lift his arm all the way up can lead to shoulder problems over time, primarily rotator cuff issues, right? Um, and oddly enough, 
most of my rotator cuff tear guys, so guys that have partial to full tears of or their rotator cuff, don't actually work pre-physical job. What are they doing most of the time? They're working at their desk. And over time, it puts a lot of strain on your rotator cuff. And what will happen is they'll work a full week, just, you know, keyboarding, keep those shoulders in that really poorly fixed forward position. And then on the weekend, they might play a sport um, or they might just do something active. They want to maybe clean the gutter of their house where they have to be overhead. They'll do something, right? And they'll tweak it. And they'll be like, oh, I hurt my shoulder. Then I'll tell them that wasn't the moment where it got hurt. You normally should be able to tolerate something like that. It's because you spend so much time in this position, the rotator cuff just got turned off. And then the moment you want to do something super active without really addressing it with strengthening or anything, it just gave out on you. And that's how you got that partial or full thickness tear. So um, there is a fix to that. First, you got to fix the position in your back, right? You got to get a little more sensitive to your back. So my favorite thing to give guys with this posture and again this is just this shouldn't be a general approach this is just one of the first things i might give is a, a foam roller thoracic extension exercise where i'll get them flat on a horizontal uh, a horizontal foam roller um, and i'll usually position them right where the shoulder blades are they'll get their hands they're going to interlace their fingers support the back of their head um, I'll ask them how far they can kind of pull their sh uh, elbows back comfortably without causing any strain into their shoulders. And what I'll get them to do is two things. One, I'll get them to tuck their tummy in. And when you tuck your tummy in, you put your low back in a bit of posterior pelvic tilt, which is good because if you don't do that, you'll get more extension through your low back. We want to focus more extension through our upper back. And so in this position, I'll get them to extend backwards as far as they comfortably can while keeping their chin tucked, okay? There are a lot of variations to this one. So you can add a deep inhalation as you're doing the stretch, which will facilitate a lot of anterior costal expansion. So um, expansion of the front of your rib cage, which will promote more extension as well. Um, I'll get them to either hold it or rep it out. Um, eventually what I might do is I might get them to add shoulder movement with it. So what I'll do is I'll put a couple pillows underneath their head in this position, and then I'll get them to also add some shoulder flexion as they extend their upper back through that foam roller to help promote more extension in the back and defeat a lot of those problems that they have, which is uh, shoulder pain, neck pain, upper back pain. So these are very, very, very general approaches, of course. Um, obviously with a lot of people, it warrants like further investigation as to why certain things are happening. Um, but these are some things that you can start applying, generally speaking to most people. Um, although you must caution them, for example, if you have any pain, sharp pain with this foam roller thoracic extension, for example, it might not be the right one for them. Conversely, if the person's getting a lot of hamstring pain or if they're getting a lot of shooting pain that's going all the way to their toes, this might not be the best stretch because now you may be yanking on their sciatic nerve and that might not be nice for them. It might lead to a few other problems. So general approaches here, but again, you just got to make sure that uh, it's suitable for them as well. So this is the end of the lecture. I finished earlier than usual, I guess 40 minutes. Um, I'll leave the next 10, 15 minutes for discussion. So if you guys have any questions, please pick my brain. Um, I'm here to answer all your questions. Can you do any damage to the glute when sitting? Um, you can do damage to pretty much most parts of the human body when sitting. Um, some of the problems with, with the glutes include um, the glutes just being turned off, right? So when, the, when you don't activate your glutes, um, they get weak over time. Another problem you might have with the glutes are pressure points that affect things like your ischial tuberosity, right? So if you guys remember the ischial tuberosity, that's the, kind of like the bottom of the pelvis. And what, what's going to happen is you're going to get a lot of compression between your ischial tuberosity, that sitting bone, and your glute, which can lead to pain, pain in the butt, basically. Um, 
load the glutes. So loading the glutes pretty much means strengthening the glutes. Um, things that will promote contraction for the glutes, right? So do you guys remember what the glutes do? We have many glutes, by the way. We have the gluteus maximus, gluteus minus, medius, and minimus, right? So um, can you guys remember the actions for the glutes? I'll, maybe I'll ask you a question now. What do the glutes do, if you guys remember from last year? So what are, what are the two main motions that the glutes complete? Let's pick your brains now. Okay, we got one answer. I would like to see a little bit more detail. So your answer is partially right, but yeah, so you, you guys are kind of along the same line. I would also ask that you add the joint, right? So if you're gonna say something like extension or abduction, make sure you add hip abduction hip extension, because most of the joints can extend as well. But absolutely right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Melanie. Um, adduction, not as much. That's more of the hip adductors. So um, your adductor magnus, your pectineus, your gracilis, those are the muscles that kind of course um, in between your thighs. Those are the ones that will bring your legs back to midline. The gluteus medius will do more hip abduction and hip external rotation. And then your gluteus maximus will do more of that hip extension, right? So when we say load the glutes, Melanie, we're, we're mostly talking about strengthening the glutes um, through exercises that will load hip extension, hip external rotation, and hip abduction. So for example, um, a barbell glute uh, hip thrust, for example, will strengthen your glute extension. Why? Because when you're doing a glute extension, maybe I can pull it up actually. Uh, um, do you guys know what I mean when I say a glute uh, uh, hip extension? Uh, sorry, a hip thrust. So that's the exercise where you kind of have like a barbell on your hip and your, your back's on a bench and you're trying to thrust your hip towards the sky. So I'll kind of show you how it looks. Knees bent, feet on the floor, shoulder blades on a bench. You got the barbell here and you're trying to thrust your hip towards the sky. That's gonna focus a little bit more on the glutes to strengthen your extension, right? Um, it's also gonna take a little bit of pressure off the hamstring because your, your knee is a little bit more bent. So your hamstring is not gonna be as activated. Although some people still feel in the hamstrings because the hamstrings are dominating the movements, um, but that's a way to strengthen glute extension. And if you wanna strengthen a little bit more gluteus medius, uh, you have to do things that are gonna promote either hip abduction or hip external rotation. So things like the clamshell, for example, right? So let me just see if my video is picking all this up. It should, because it's the GoPro. Let's see. Yeah, it should. So just move this chair out of the way. So you got your, if you're lying down on your side, let's say, and both your knees are bent here, if you're doing a clamshell, you're doing a little bit of hip abduction with a mix of hip external rotation. And that's gonna load your gluteus medius now, right? Um, to load it even more, you can put a resistant band around your knees. Um, you could put a weight on top of your knee over here. You could do it in a side plank where you're in a side plank and you're doing your clamshells. You can do side lifts too. So it doesn't necessarily have to be with your knees bent. You could do predominantly um, hip abduction um, as long as you're leading with the heel, you get a little more gluteus medius activation. Um, so those are things, those are ways you can kind of load the glutes, both the uh, gluteus uh, maximus and gluteus medius. Good question. What other questions do you guys have? And don't be shy guys, seriously. Did you guys have any questions about the slides?
Yes. We're going to actually dive into fascia a lot. Um, I mentioned that we're going to talk about fascia today. Um, fascia is a form of connective tissues, right? So keep a lot of the uh, concepts we talked about in mind. Oops. So when we're talking about things like um, the piezoelectric effect um, or fibroblasts or connective tissue plasticity, um, I'm really kind of like focusing on connective tissue, right? And fascia is a form of connective tissue. Um, and the reason why connective tissue is so important is that um, it pretty much surrounds all the main tissues of the human body, right? So your muscles, even at the level of muscle fibers are surrounded by fascia. Um, your, your skin surrounded by fascia, like your epithelium, um, your neurons, right? We talked about, I think last year, we, we spent a little bit of time talking about neuroscience and how the nerves of the human body are surrounded by myelin. Um, but you're also at the, at the very small level, you're surrounded by things like epineurium, right? Which is a fascial covering of your nerves. Um, but yeah, um, fascia, fascia is pretty much everywhere. Connective tissues ever, everywhere, right? Um, so we will dive a little bit more into it for sure. And connective tissue is so important because it connects everything, right? That's where the term comes from. Um, but it's also the thing that kind of supports everything in place. Without our connective tissue, we'd pretty much be like a bag of bones, basically, right? We'd just be like a root. Like there wouldn't be any structural integrity to the human body. Um, muscles would just be jumping out all over the place without having their you know, nice structural units. Um, nerves wouldn't be able to conduct electricity the way they should. Um, so we're definitely really going to dive into fascia and we're, I'm thinking maybe even focusing a little bit more on fascia because it's, it's a topic that doesn't get talked about too much. And I'm not sure why. Um, I think part of the reason why fascia doesn't get talked about as much is because, um, we always try to dissect and look at the muscles and like the functional organs. Um, but the fascia and the connective tissue in general just has so much, it has so many properties that support the body and it's so essential to the way we move even, right? Um, it's just really difficult because the fascia just connects everything together. And so understanding where the functional units are, it's a little bit difficult with fascia, but it is really important. But yes, we'll definitely get into fascia. Probably more in the next couple of lectures, actually. But yeah. Any other questions, guys? Do you have any questions about any kind of injuries, pains you might be dealing with right now? That's awesome. Stay super healthy, guys. Stay healthy. Keep exercising. Keep moving. Get your walking in. Research shows that walking at least 11 minutes a day will do tr tremendous things for your health in terms of your mental health, your ability to sleep more effectively at night. Um, so walk, walk, walk. Make sure you walk outside. Um, take your vitamin D, vitamin C. I'm not recommending this as a physiotherapist because I'm not allowed to speak on you know supplementation and medication. I'm more talking about just my personal research on those kind of things. Um, but there are kind of a cool few doctors out there that have researched vitamin D, one of them being Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Um, she's a really cool one to kind of listen to about the effects of vitamin D on our immune system. Um, but yeah, movement, movement's going to be the medicine for 2021, right? As we all wait for the vaccines to come out. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll keep you guys posted about the plan for the next lecture. My hope is to eventually get the lecture slides out the day before. I tried so hard this time. I just, I don't know why I'm still not able to, but my goal for next week is to get the lecture slides out 
latest by Wednesday night. So at least you guys will have something to review a little bit before the class starts. Um, again, we're going to be sticking with this theme of a little more function, a little less like traditional anatomy. So I think you guys like, for the most part, everyone was in the last class. So you guys have that basic understanding of um, typical anatomy. And yeah, that's the plan going forward. We're going to get more and more into function, okay? Yeah, no problem. Thank you for attending. So yeah, guys, if you guys have any other questions, let me know. If not, um, it was awesome teaching you guys today, and I look forward to the next one. All right, guys, have a lovely day, have a lovely weekend, and we'll meet again on Thursday.